Good morning, everybody. I hope you actually don't need too much coffee uh, for this panel. Um, I think we've actually got a good panel. And um, let me just get right into it and, and introduce who we have. Um, so uh, to my far left, Olga Kolkareva, who works for Synthesis, which is a uh, statistical arbitrage quant uh, fund. Uh, it's not a startup. It's a spin out. They've been in business for a while. And she is here to defend the honor and integrity of quant funds. Uh, against the allocators. Uh, and um, uh, next is Jennifer Keeney, who uh, moved to BNY Mellon after years at Russell, uh, and they're launching their new uh, investor solutions, OCIO, Portfolio Management Services, and she's got a lot of insight into what it takes to actually build uh, a platform to, uh, to evaluate managers and evaluate funds. Uh, and then to my immediate left, Mark Raskoff from, uh, uh, from Russell. Yes, they do know each other and they did work together for many years. Uh, Mark claims that Jennifer is his favorite person at Russell. Uh, Mark is um, in charge of a number of things. He's a, he's a PM, he's a head of uh, direct, um, sorry? Uh, tactical trading, and uh, he's been allocating to, to hedge funds for, for many, many years. Um, it's been an interesting year. Uh, I guess that's a little bit of an understatement. Um, and not, uh, you know, we, this is one of those years where following the financial crisis, uh, you know, we were waiting for a year where funds could really show what they were capable of doing. And uh, you know, all of us were hopeful, well, many of us were hopeful that uh, this would be the year that um, fund managers' strategies really won the day. Uh, it's been a little bit more mixed than that. Uh, what, what happened in 2019? What, uh, what worked? What didn't, Mark? Well, uh, so these are general observations, and I think they're a function of the managers that I'm seeing. And um, so any, anytime you make broad generalizations, you just have to remember that you know, in the back of your mind. But so essentially what I'm seeing is on the top end returns around 30%. And on the bottom end, something like down 10%. Uh, most of the funds in the past 10, 11 months are only up a few percent, which in my opinion, uh, it was, it's been a very disappointing year, frankly, particularly versus long-only equities. And S&P has really been my sort of nemesis for the past 10 years. Um, but really quickly, comparing pure machine learning strategies with intuition-based algorithms, I think uh, one pretty clear uh, trend this year is that machine learning definitely uh, has done better. I'd say they won this year. Uh, what I'm seeing is the traditional approaches are starting to perform like the market's getting quite crowded. They've suffered a lot from factor reversals, and you all have probably seen that. Growth and momentum have been extremely volatile. Um, that said, within the more traditional strategies, um, one's managers that have done better include folks with more international exposure, Japan, Europe, China, and India has actually done well too. Um, one of the things that we do to try to uh, understand uh, the potential for uh, sensitivity to various factors is run some uh, analysis of returns against axioma and some other homegrown strategies. And we just, over and over, we see very statistically significant factor loading to things like uh, dividend yield, growth obviously, medium-term momentum, profitability, volatility, and things like that. So even though these are quote-unquote um, quantitative strategies, you know, there's definitely a lot of factor loading. I think that's important for, to, for investors to understand and realize. Um, really quickly, I just wanted to say why I think some of the bigger shops have underdelivered, and we had kind of a little bit of a heated uh, dis discussion about 15 minutes ago about this. Frankly, I think a lot of the bigger quant shops need still to continue to satisfy capacity demands. And when they're trying to accomplish that, they're interviewing team after team. And I think there's far more teams for hire with decent track records that use more traditional quant equity approach. I think that for a lot of investors, ourselves included at Russell, we're, there's still a little bit of reputational risk for investing in pure machine learning approaches, and I think it's because of this white box thing, and Olga, I'm sure we'll touch on that. Uh, bigger firms still need sort of a, a decision framework for making sense of the models, and pure machine learning processes are harder to, comfy, to get comfy with what's actually happening. 
So it's harder for big quant shops to allocate to machine learning teams where you can't really understand the forecasts or what the errors in the forecasts could be. And the very last thing I want to say before I uh, pass it along, machine learning is definitely used by a lot of these uh, bigger quant shops, but what I'm seeing um, is that it's, it's mostly used for information collection or selecting portfolio construction parameters, or it's used as a conditioner to more traditional factor models. Um, I've even heard some of the big shops talk about machine learning as a technique, but not a standalone strategy. And uh, I know that's, uh, that's a little bit of a cop-out answer. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I'm seeing this year. So there it is, Mark laying out the, uh, the basis of the feud on the, on the lines of uh, Taylor Swift and Kanye West. Um, Olga, what's the other side of this? Mark is talking about uh, uh, you know, some of the problems with the big shops. What's different with some of the newer shops? Why, why don't they suffer from some of these, uh, these same issues? Yeah, certainly. Um, I would like to address the emergence of the new type of asset managers. And we believe our firm is one of those asset managers, um, is the process based around machine learning. And what's interesting, um, when we discussed that before, you called it, I think, next generation, right? And I think I really want to be careful with this definition uh, because I posted something on social media about this new generation of quants, and I got a lot of comments from um, traditional quants who got really offended, <laughs> as in this new generation of managers are here to replace traditional discretionary, traditional quant. I don't think that is the, that's the case. So first of all, I think, so machine learning is not necessarily like a strategy, it's just a tool and an approach. Um, and now I would distinguish between uh, pure and dedicated machine learning funds and managers that employ machine learning in their process. And that can be uh, discretionary manager, managers and quantitative managers. Uh, but if we talk about dedicated machine learning funds, I kind of disagree with the approach of allocators that look at them as a part of a quant bucket. I don't think it's fair because, and again, it's a matter of definition. So traditional definition, like a textbook definition of discretionary versus quant, is that discretionary is based on human experience and human judgment based on what a human learned from their experience. And quant is traditionally uh, rule-based. So there is no biases, there is no experience, it's just if, then. That's a traditional algorithm. So from that perspective, machine learning is by no means a traditional algorithm. It's not if, then. It, is actually, it actually, if anything, it resembles a human learning process. A machine actually learns from the data and make conclusions that we can't really 100%, uh, we can't really explain with 100% certainty. And so from that perspective, I wouldn't put it in the quant bucket, but also we can't really put it in a discretionary bucket either because other parameters of those strategies, they're closer to quants. Like the breadth of the universe, it's much more likely to come from a quant team than a discretionary team. So I submit the idea that this pure machine learning funds need to be uh, classified as a separate group and approached as a separate uh, type of hedge funds and type of investment approaches. With that said, I think uh, big shops, they do work on their data strategies, on their machine learning strategies. They invest quite a bit in that. Um, and it's important to consider this new tool that they are all using and they have exposure. And I actually strongly believe that in the, in the nearest future, there will be no hedge fund that will have like zero exposure to at least any product of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and predictive analytics. And as long as they have that exposure, so do their investors and their allocators. Right, and, but when you say these, um, these strategies can't have biases because they're just rules-based, obviously the biases can be baked, baked into the rules themselves, right? I mean, don't you still, and I guess this is more a question for Jennifer, uh, we're talking a lot about what machine learning is, what it isn't, who's really using machine learning, who's not, who are the pretenders. Um, isn't there still a need for people in this process? Uh, definitely. Um, I, I agree that the use of this data improves processes and increases um, efficiencies, but there still has to be manual oversight um, into 
um, the use of the data, and it has to be used responsibly and um, intelligently. Um, you have, I think, you know, it actually creates the need to have highly trained professionals that can interpret the data um, and scrutinize it and make sure that um, there are no regulatory compliance issues, um, perhaps related to uh, materially non-public information or privacy issues. Um, I think you have to have people involved that can create contingency plans for the managers in the event that this alternative data is no longer available, and that's um, key for the manager to implement their investment process. Yeah, you've got regulatory risk with some of this data, right? I mean, the, the sources of the data could be shut off unilaterally in some cases. I, I agree. Um, so. There, there's the upcoming California privacy law that's going to be implemented in January of 2020. Um, last year there was uh, GDPR in the EU, so there are a lot of you know, regulatory issues to be aware of. So I think the more extensively a manager uses alternative data, um, the more that we would expect from an ODD perspective for their chief compliance officer to have alternative data policies. Um, and that's something that we don't see a lot of. Um, so either people have it or they don't have it. Um, so it will be interesting to see how that develops. Right, and, and you just raised two important issues. If you do have California investors, you've got to think about this California data protection laws. And uh, if you have uh, you know, European managers, they're not able to get SEC registered right now because of a dispute between the SEC and, and uh, Europe over GDPR. So look, I mean, these are, these are affecting us now. Uh, moving on a little bit because look, I mean, all of this takes, machine learning is not, uh, you know, you give a, a machine a few rules and then everything's done. This costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, it's not a set it and forget it kind of, of thing. Given all the effort that it takes, uh, and given some of the, the issues with the returns that we've seen, why are quant managers worth it? What are they worth? What kind of fees should we be seeing out of quant managers um, with this backdrop? It's gonna be a long answer. <laughs> I actually have a pretty strong opinion about uh, the criticism towards hedge funds and its business model. I think so hedge funds are being criticized for too high of a fees and like disappointing returns. But I think it's a matter of definition. So we initially define hedge fund as an alpha generating product that is supposed to deliver uncorrelated absolute return. Now S&P goes up and all of a sudden we want a relative return. <laughs> we don't want absolute return anymore. And then we create indices and we measure how hedge fund perform as an asset class. Well, first, it's not an asset class. And second, the dispersion of alpha generating alternative strategies, they are supposed to be much greater than in any other products, and they are. And so as we, as investors, push investment managers to grow their funds in terms of assets under management, so now we have how much? Three trillion in hedge funds and more than 10,000 funds. Like, can we expect that they, their entire profits are pure alpha? I mean, chances are some of those people that are in business of raising assets, some of them are in business of capturing beta, some of them are in business of cap capturing traditional factors, and that's okay. Those are great products, uh, but they should be priced differently. So my idea of the correct pricing is probably any exposure, any access product to factors or beta should be priced at a management fee. Well, management fee can be different depending on how hard it is to replicate those factors and the access to that exposure. Uh, now, true hedge funds, that's a def different story. But again, I don't think the 220 business model is actually correct and fair. Uh, management fee. A lot of times management fee, especially uh, emerging managers, they justify it, well, I need money to build my business. How many businesses do you know that overcharge you for their product because they need money to build their business, right? There are other ways to do that. They can raise equity capital, they can borrow money, Management fee in hedge funds might be uh, a premium for a privilege to access the capacity in that fund. But before that happens, the, the product needs to prove, like for example, how much would you pay to access capacity of a instance medallion fund? I would pay quite a bit, but, but there's no way for us to do that, right? Olga, you're supposed to be taking the side of the hedge funds here. What, I am, I am, I am taking it as, a, yeah, yeah, <laughs> bear with me. I'm like, I promise I'm not gonna take too long with that. Now, performance fee. Performance fee is also known as incentive fee for a reason. 
because it was supposed to incentivize the manager to take the right amount of risk. Now, flat performance fee of 20% kind of incentivize them to, uh, to gamble, right? Because like a free option. Um, so my idea of the performance fee that would, could make sense for alpha generating strategy, and that's something that we implement in our company, is a performance fee based on uh, risk, per, uh, risk uh, parameter. So we based our performance fee on the formula with sharp ratio. It's basically a multiple of a sharp ratio. So basically the hedge fund manager is getting um, compensated for the amount of risk they take to achieve a certain performance. So, the, but, but it's not the only way. I just think that there's nothing wrong about making it a little bit too complex to make it a little bit, too, a little bit more fair. I like Mark? the sound of that, yeah. yeah. I've never seen it, never seen that ever, frankly. But I like the sound of it. Uh, just going back to the question, what, what should you pay for? Um, all this might not be practical, but um, it's probably a wish list. You know, I think right now you gotta look for managers that focus on crowding mechanisms and pay more for that. So people that focus on short interest, you know, people who know where the flows are going and what other funds are doing. Um, because we don't know what's causing the volatility factors, you know, one rational conclusion, at least for me, could be to pay more for funds that immunize portfolios against residual factor risks. Um, and this to me feels a lot like uh, going back to when discretionary macro and long short equity managers were looking at the uh, positioning of CTAs and uh, risk parity and risk premium and constant volatility funds and understanding those footprints and those flows before making their discretionary bets. It's the same thing. So once you, you, know, once you understand uh, what the market's doing, uh, I, I think you're a far better investor. So I think it's harder for a lot of bigger shops to accomplish this because they rely on, on factor strategies. In fact, I've heard a lot of the bigger firms say that they're skeptical that crowding is leading to reversals in factor performance. You know, who knows? Um, and most folks will admit it's harder to find signals that have alpha after immunizing, right? I think that's pretty common. Uh, so still, uh, there's so much money in risk premium, trend following risk parity, constant volatility, and so on, that knowing your sensitivity to these residual factors is important, and I think it should be part of the value prop proposition and should be baked into the uh, fees. You really have to ask yourself, what's the right price for momentum exposure for small alpha that has good capacity, right? You should just always ask yourself that question. Lastly, immunizing itself is difficult. Um, every time Barr comes out with a new model revision, there's more factors to immunize to. So it's kind of a big, you know, pain in the neck never stops. You end up constantly fitting models to the new back bar factors, and it just becomes a huge effort. But so those are my thoughts on paying for alpha. Well, that's Mark's wish list. Uh, Jennifer, when we're talking about bringing technology to the ODD process, what, what can we do to actually capture some of these factors? What can you do to make the process more efficient? I think people on both sides of the process uh, find it, frankly, mind-numbing, tedious, the worst part of their job. Um, what, what are you doing to make sure. it better? So operational due diligence is an arduous process. Um, to do an operational due diligence review on a hedge fund manager, we need to review about two dozen documents. Um, the fund formation documents include the private <laughs> offering memorandum, the limited partnership agreement, uh, investment management agreements, financial statements, regulatory filings, uh, marketing materials, due diligence questionnaires, et cetera. It's, it's a long process. Um, it can, it can be a volume of over a thousand pages. It can take us about 40 hours to do a single hedge fund, depending on how complex it is. So um, as you mentioned, I just joined a new firm and we're implementing the operational due diligence process from scratch. And right now we're doing um, information sessions with about a dozen different vendors who offer software with machine learning capabilities that have um, that would allow us to do that type of reading more efficiently. So it could scan all of these documents and look for nuances in liquidity terms and valuation terms. Um, if, if a certain manager was using a certain prime broker or administrator that 
uh, was in a situation of crisis and we could quickly scan, do some keyword scanning across all these documents. Um, some of these vendors have some web scraping capabilities where they could um, extract information from uh, websites such as the SEC and we could um, highlight any changes with a manager's form ADV um, and that would allow us to you know, see any events associated with that manager quickly. And I know that scares you. <laughs> So, but, but right now it's, it's just, you know, it's sort of like a lot of hedge funds say they don't use Excel for accounting anymore or they shouldn't and you know, a lot of people are, aren't using clunky Word documents, they're using um, software that enables you to generate a report, you know, quickly in minutes instead of, instead of hours. So um, we're trying to bring operational due diligence into a new generation and, and make it more effective. The only thing that terrifies me about that is that there are five or six documents that you mentioned that my clients never send me. <laughs> like, okay, so, uh, but you know, it's a case of we just don't know what, uh, you know, what those ADVs are going to spit out. I mean, obviously we review them every year, but you know, maybe the reviews haven't been as close uh, as they should have been. The SEC only recently started to look at those uh, seriously as disclosure documents. So, uh, you know, that's an area where we definitely have to have to keep an eye out. Yeah. And, and I've heard the SEC's um, market abuse unit is using um, data analytics to detect fraud through behavior analysis as well. So um, if they're using it, we want to use it as well. I have some clients very far from New York who have asked, well, how will the SEC catch me? And I was like, <laughs> just a second. They, they've got data analytics too. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Mark, Jennifer's presented kind of the good side of the, uh, the technology. Uh, any headaches associated with, with developing these processes? Well, I don't, I don't know how many of y'all are involved in performance reporting. <laughs> I already have the pleasure of being involved in performance reporting. But for me, it's a necessary evil, but it's probably the most brain damaging aspect of my job. And what we're doing right here, right now, and we're in sort of version 1.0, is using uh, natural language processing to sort of do a first cut a very uh, you know simple performance reporting. What happened in the market? You know, feed it sort of a manager report uh, and have it you know consolidate that into something that makes some sense, uh, and then have a human review it. That's probably just going to make our process a whole heaping hell of a lot more efficient. And literally, it takes one of the most painful parts of this job, uh, performance reporting, uh, and makes it just a little more. Uh, palatable. But like I said, we're in version 1.0. I think this is going to be a multi-year project. It's clearly noth nothing is, is at this point uh, client ready, but I think these tools are there. Uh, if people are using them, we really got to make use of it and make our business more efficient. So we're, we're taking the first few steps. Great. What needs to change in the ODD process? What, um, you know, Olga, I think you had some, some strong views on this. Uh, you know, how does the ODD chop process need to change? kind of uh, to really give a fair shot to uh, to quant managers, especially the new breed that you've been talking about. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, make a couple of comments on that. But before that, I just wanted to mention, it's pretty fascinating. I just recently read an article about some management firms that employ artificial intelligence to write responses for to RFP, RFPs and to write uh, like monthly, quarterly reports. And now apparently like other AI algorithms are reading. <laughs> That's pretty fascinating. So the, the industry kind of becoming really automated uh, even from the due diligence um, standpoint point. Uh, for speaking about like new managers and how the industry is changing. So first of all, if we talk about this new generation, continue talking about new generation of machine learning funds, um, they will not be sending you their views on the market every month because that's irrelevant. They don't really have any views on the market. Uh, but what's important to track, and you can track this for most of those strategies because they tend to be very liquid, they tend to be with um, uh, exchange-traded instruments, uh, daily NAV, that is something that, well, from my early days in the hedge fund space, it was not like commonly accepted practice, and it kind of should be, because it gives you a lot more data points to run your, uh, your analysis and to see how the strategy performs within this reporting period, which can be very important for many reasons. Another important thing about machine learning, and we had this interesting conversation with, with Mark uh, before we started the panel, uh, how do you make sure you understand how the manager 
would perform if they have limited track record. And it's always been a trade-off with track record. Like we have some um, reliable re research that says that early in the life cycle, emerging managers, they outperform even their own performance later in their life cycle. So it's kind of the, the investor wants to be in early, but at the same time, like we kind of reluctant working with uh, someone who doesn't have a track record. With machine learning, you can actually reliably replicate that track record. So what happens is you can take that same rules of building that machine learning algorithm, uh, not necessarily you as an allocator, but you ask manager to do that, and that put that machine in a different point in time in the past, and basically change your in sample data set in your out sample data set. You can do this with a human being. I cannot pretend that I'm in 2008 and I know nothing after that point in time, right? You can do that. Uh, you totally can do that with machine learning. The only limitation, and you probably wouldn't be able to do that with our strategy, is because the data is not, the, the historical data sample for alternative data and some of the novel data sets, they're not there. However, in like five years, 10 years, when the his historical data sample will be long enough, we will definitely see more mach pure machine learning funds and like more tools to analyze those funds. So this is about machine learning. And then something that applies to, I would argue, most of the strategies, like regardless of whether it's discretionary or quant or machine learning, is the data component that needs to be analyzed and spe specifically from the operational due diligence perspective. So here's what happens. They have exposure to certain data sources from the investment perspective because certain, uh, att uh, definitely um, performance attribution analysis needs to be done and how much of their performance, uh, how much of their alpha is attributed to a particular data source and how big is the concentration on one data source and two data sources and what's gonna happen if this data source ceases to exist tomorrow, right? Like what happens with their performance? Do they have a replacement in mind? How long will it take them to replace and so on? Now in terms of the um, legal and compliance perspective. You mentioned California law, and it's a little bit more complex than what you mentioned. In fact, if you're a hedge fund, you allocate to hedge fund, and a hedge fund uses um, some data set on consumer behavior, and one of those consumers happens to be a California resident. Now, the vendor is in trouble, hedge fund is in trouble, and then you are in trouble, right? So that adds to operational due diligence, and you have to ask all the questions. Well, that's, uh, that's a great point, and something that we never saw before is I was never putting our data privacy lawyers together with, with the fund managers. There was just no need for it before. But now we're doing, we're doing things like audits on data sources so we can understand where the trigger points, where the choke points might be from a regulatory perspective to see when those flows could be shut off and how they could be shut off if there's you know, some unilateral government action that could take it or if there has to be a process, things like that. So helping plan. people come up with kind of a risk-based, uh, you know, idea of, of um, what, uh, what the risks are for, the, for, for data sources. Um, Jennifer, I think we're gonna close out here, but you're in the process of, of building a platform. Um, how are you, what kind of things are you doing to, to take into account some of these risks like data sources or, or just the different profile that quant managers have uh, from other managers? I, I think the managers need to adapt and revisit their compliance policies and supervisory policies around this. Um, I think it's kind of similar to the use of expert networking firms about 10 years ago. And there was a lot of you know, abuse on both sides of expert networking firms, um, you know, on the manager side and the firms themselves. So as a result, the investment managers had to develop consistent compliance practices. So that's something that we're looking for here, that when managers are using alternative data, what sort of you know, new policies have they implemented, not only in their compliance manual, but their code of ethics, because the tone is set at the top. Um, you know, similar to what you said about if they suddenly no longer have access to this data, what is the contingency plan in place? Um, also, we, we look at it from an expense point of view. If this is a fund expense or a management company expense, are they sharing this source, um, this alternative data source with another sub-advisor? Is it spread across all funds? You know, this is something that 
we previously hadn't considered. So, um, you know, as managers are adapting their processes, so do we. I think that's a great point and, and maybe a good place to end. Even as we're developing all of these technological solutions uh, on the ODD side, um, there's a regulator on the other side that's also looking at expenses, it's also looking at performance. Um, you know, really alternative data shouldn't give rise to MNPI or, or, or those kinds of issues. It really shouldn't. But you've got somebody on the other side, um, you know, looking for suspicious trades and, and that has very, um, uh, very sophisticated algorithms to, to do that. Um, so everything that we're doing on, on our side of the business, um, there's somebody on the other side of the business uh, taking a look at it. So it's, uh, it is uh, still buyer beware. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. I hope uh, you found this uh, an entertaining panel, uh, and uh, now time to, uh, to move on to the next one. Thank you.